New MacBook info and how the update cycle will look going forward. I'm IKF Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing because we have got some good stuff for you today. I've said for quite some time now that I think Apple will be doing annual updates of their M series chips just like they do with the A series chips and just like they will do with the M1X chips and the M2X chips. I think it's all going to be annual and I think that every Mac is going to get updated every year and that's a really good thing and we are going to talk about why. I published my first Apple Silicon timeline way back in September of 2020 and it got a pretty respectable 10,000 views, especially when you consider that my videos were typically doing between 200 and 1,000 views at the time. At that time, we were expecting a 12-inch fanless MacBook, which turned out to be the MacBook Air with the fan removed, and a 13-inch MacBook Pro. I also predicted a Mac Mini in that video, which nobody else had mentioned as far as I can tell before the event, because everybody seemed to be really shocked when that one arrived. In the same video, I said that we'd get a 24-inch iMac at a spring event, although I did say March, because that's what the track record had, but I also thought we would get the uh, MacBook Pro 16-inch then as well, and then I predicted a 30-inch iMac, an iMac Pro and a Mac Pro for WWDC. So at least I started out strong. But as of this week, we have new information that Apple is, according to Dylan DKT, planning to launch the M2 chip with the redesigned MacBook Air early in 2022. Now, if you've been following along with the channel, you know that I've been expecting the M2 to arrive towards the end of this year with the M1X coming at WWDC. But I'm starting to think now in July that I might not be right about that date for the M1X. So with all the new information that we have up till now, I think it's time to update what I'm expecting and uh, what the timeline will be for Apple's product releases for the rest of this year and into 2022. As well as why I'm still convinced that Apple Silicon will mean that Macs will be able to get their annual updates in future, even the Mac Pro. We just have to let Apple settle into their stride first. And of course, we have pretty stuff to look at, all courtesy of resident render boy Apple Tomorrow, who you should go and follow on Twitter, and also, while you're there, follow me as well, at iCave underscore Dave. So let's get started. Last November, as you're probably aware, we got a MacBook Pro, a MacBook Air, and a Mac Mini, all with Apple's M1 inside. And these were followed in the spring by the iMac with the same chip. That's the 24-inch model and the iPad Pro, the 12.9-inch and 11-inch uh, models, both with the M1 chip inside too. Now, the M1 for context consists of four Ice Storm efficiency cores, four Firestorm performance cores, and an 8-core GPU with options for 8 or 16 gigabytes of unified memory. Now, that means that it's a single memory pool that the CPU and GPU can access at the same time, and that eliminates the latency of copying data between discrete memory pools on the board. And those Firestorm and Ice Storm cores are exactly the same ones that you will find in your iPhone 12 if you own one. So you, in the iPhone, you get two of the Firestorm performance cores, four of the Ice Storm efficiency cores, and a four-core GPU. So in terms of what we don't have yet from Apple on the Mac front, we have the larger iMac, the Mac Pro, and our 14 and 16-inch MacBook Pros. Now, the iMac and the MacBook Pros are expected to feature the M1X chip, which is a 10-core CPU, but split as two Ice Storm cores, which is the efficiency ones, and eight Firestorm cores, effectively doubling the CPU performance from the M1. On the GPU front, the latest rumors have pointed to 16 and 32 core graphics options too, although it's not clear if these will be a choice within the systems or if you will get 16 core graphics on the smaller MacBooks and possibly the 24 inch M1X iMac as well if they do one of those and then the 32 core option being reserved for the 16 inch MacBook Pro and the 30 to 32 inch iMac although I'm thinking we might well get 31 and a half inches. Now I'd also hope that we will see a Mac Mini with the M1X at the same time as these but when is that time? Well, I'm now coming to terms with the fact that M1X powered Macs are not going to be coming in June although I've been hearing about a possible July 20th date all of the latest information that we're hearing from all of the other sources is speaking to a September introduction, at least for the MacBook Pro. Now, I was always sceptical that Apple would introduce M1X and M2 close together, 
but now the idea that M2 might not be arriving until spring of 2022 makes September sound a little bit more sensible. Now, I do think that Apple would prefer to introduce all of their M1X models together so that they can talk once about the SoC and offer multiple form factors, so I would hope they'll all arrive together in September or at least near to that, though the event would likely have to be shared with the iPhone, and that could be a hell of a lot of stuff to introduce together. September typically also sees iPhones, iPads, iPad Air, Apple Watch, but we're also expecting AirPods this year, so that's really a lot to have turning up all at one event. Now, there's a non-zero chance that some of these products could get pushed to October, perhaps the iPads and Apple Watches, which were paired up in uh, September of 2020 when the iPhones were delayed by a month. So once all of that stuff is out of the way, we get our M1X stuff, fingers crossed it all comes together. We then come to spring of 2022, and this is when we will likely see the redesigned MacBook Air with M2. As in the past, the AX chips have typically come at that time of year, and the M1 is basically the successor to the A12X, A12Z line of chips. So the new MacBook Air is expected to come in a new flatter design language along the lines of what we have with the iPad Pro, dropping the tapered wedge shape that it's had since 2008. But we mentioned M2 and it's probably a good idea to talk about what that's going to mean too and our best assumption is that it will be the same CPU core layout as the M1 with four each of the efficiency and performance cores along with a 10 core GPU but also with a 9 core GPU version available at a more entry level price. In terms of the performance that we would expect from this the M2 will be using cores from the A15 chip generation so it won't be Firestorm and Storm cores but we've heard Avalanche as a possible name for the the bigger cores. We don't know the name for the smaller ones at this point, but hopefully that won't be too long. But performance wise, we're expecting probably around about 25% faster. And that would be going into, as I say, the MacBook Air, the Mac Mini, and possibly a 24 inch iMac 2. Now, the question mark product for me would be the 13 inch MacBook Pro. I don't know if that's going to get an M2 or if they'll move up to the 14 inch chassis or possibly just even skip over the M2 altogether for the MacBook Pros and just keep those for the MX series chips. I would though expect to see the M1 MacBook Air and possibly the Mac Mini stay in the line with M1 inside, potentially with a lower price point. Now in the past I've called these kind of legacy ones uh, the SE Max, which I think would be a pretty good name to have a, a Mac Mini SE and a MacBook Air SE. And they could get smaller drives, maybe drop into 128 gigabytes along with the price cut. So I'd love to see the Mac Mini going closer to the $500 where it first started, but it would be more likely to go to $599 and maybe a $749 MacBook Air M1 with 128 gigs of storage. Then at WWDC, where Apple Silicon and its two-year rollout were first announced, I'd expect to see that Mac Pro being unveiled, and I do think that it will feature multiple M1X SoCs, as we've heard about a 20 and 40 core version, with four efficiency and 16 uh, performance cores, and eight efficiency and 32 performance cores as the options coming from that side. Also, these could be going up to 128 GPU cores, which is going to be pretty mental. There's also a decent possibility that this could actually come out with M2X chips, but regardless, I'd expect to see the multiple SoCs working together in these, and I also expect that they will reveal it at the event uh, WWDC 2022, but it won't ship until later in the year. But then going forward, I think we could well get the uh, regular cadence of a September M1X, M2X, M3X launch for the range of those, and then a spring launch for the M1, M2, M3, M4 generation chips. So that would be when we're taking the cores from the A series chips from the September launch of the iPhones, putting those into the M series chips, which gives you the little performance bump there. And also it's basically your AX chip. And then later in the year, you throw even more cores at it and uh, put it into the more powerful Max, which should have around about 100% more performance than the, uh, the non-X version of the chips that they release in the springtime six months earlier. So that makes a little bit of sense to me. Let me know if that actually makes sense to you, uh, and let me know before we get into answering your questions in I Gave Answers what you think of this roadmap, 
down in the comments. What did I get right and what is miles off? So let's get into iCave Answers. If you want to ask a question on the show, all you do, hashtag iCave Answers down in the comments section with your question. And as long as it's appropriate for the show, we will uh, answer it. First up, Sander Hoodland. iCave Answers, could you explain what people mean when they say that Love to Dream is retired? Because as far as I know, he's, he or she still does the exact same thing that they did before. What am I missing? Okay, so this actually came from Love to Dream themselves saying that they were retiring and not putting out any more rumours. And actually since then, we've had all of Apple going after leakers a little bit more, their legal teams being a little bit more aggressive in talking to people who are leaking Apple um, information. And it looks very much like uh, that's one of the people that Apple has gone after. And at, at this point, I think they are done with leaks. It looks very much like they have said, right, that's it. We are done. But yeah, previously, Love to Dream had said that they weren't going to put out any more rumours and uh, and stopped for a little while and then started up again. And now I think is done now. But we will see. Depends how long retirement is. The Weird Channel Amazement asks, what is this thing about audio OS? So we mentioned this on yesterday's show. Um, obviously, we've just had WWDC um, a month or so ago, and Apple announced, uh, obviously, all of their new software platforms for their devices. So you've got iOS, iPadOS, macOS, watchOS, uh, tvOS, and audioOS is the one that they never kind of talk about specifically because I don't think it's even a public uh, a publicized name for the majority of apple's platforms they will offer a public beta um program so that the general public can test these once it's been through the first couple of stages of developer testing once it's been through the first couple of phases of developer testing then the general public can get access to this software so that they can install it on their devices at their own risk in order to um, test out the features, give feedback to Apple, all that kind of thing. Now, there are good ways of doing this and there are bad ways of doing this. So there are websites out there for pro provisioning, basically, where they will give you uh, somehow access to the early developer betas without being a member of the developer program. And it looks like that is what's happened with people installing the new version of Audio OS onto their home pods. Now the problem with that is that there is an issue with the current build that they've put into these test beta program versions that are out there and people who don't know what they're doing have put it onto their home pods and now their home pods are getting far too hot because of the error in the code and uh, actually frying the boards which basically makes them uh, unusable. And it's not something that Apple is going to cover because it, that software shouldn't be on there. It's not licensed to be used on there. Um, but it did give us a bit of an indication of what might happen if Apple had to open up their hardware to other app stores. Now, you might wonder why, because obviously computers can run uh, software that comes from anywhere. Macs can run software that comes from anywhere. But they're sort of also designed to, and they have an operating system that is designed to kind of monitor what they're using and uh, and keep an eye on all that sort of thing. If people are putting unauthorized apps into uh, an app store that's not checked by Apple, there's nothing to say that these devices that were designed only to be running stuff that has been checked and is known to work with the hardware. There is a, a decent argument to say that this could also cause physical damage to your devices. Uh, and that would be a bad thing. So at least for me personally, I'm really hoping that Apple doesn't have to open up to external app stores. It does make it a lot less secure as much as people say, give me the choice. Simply having the choice there, having the uh, ability in the operating system to do it does open you up to a lot of malware coming into your device, even if you then don't choose to go to these app stores to download stuff, but there will be fake websites, there will be phishing stuff out there that is trying to trick you into thinking that you're in the regular app store when you are not. And Team Kinetics asks, IK answers, if the M1X and rumoured Mac Pro SoCs are as powerful as suggested, do you think there's any risk of crypto miners buying up bulk loads of units? With a significant shortage of next-gen consoles and graphics cards at present, would Apple's new processors be attractive to miners? Can you mine using Apple Silicon? In answer to the last part first, yes, you can absolutely do it. Uh, whether it's cost-effective is another matter. So I, just to find out kind of what goes on with it and just to sort of experiment and find out a little bit more about uh, what you do to mine, I set it up on my Mac Mini uh, and I had it sitting there mining stuff the difficulty is at this point because um a it's not a particularly uh gpu powerful system it's absolutely capable but it's not um it's not a 3090 i 
think the hash rate for it was going to be making me something like 18 cents a day. Can you mine on Apple Silicon? Yes. Should you mine on Apple Silicon? Probably not. But in terms of M1X, uh, the, the thing with Apple stuff is, A, the systems in general are not cheap. Um, they're not overly expensive for what you get, but they're not cheap. And in general, most miners will want to have multiple graphics cards in a single tower. Um, they tend to run them as headless systems, so it's unlikely that they would want to buy MacBooks. They would probably want to get Mac Minis, if anything. And uh, we we just don't know. Uh, I, I think it's going to be price prohibitive uh, for the amount of return that they would get comparatively and that's that's not because the graphics will be low power but more the fact that for every gpu that you get you're also getting a cpu and you're also getting the memory and you're also getting its own power supply because you can't just hook a whole bunch of the gpu parts of an m1 or an m1x into a single system uh, in order to get the most possible power. Hopefully that makes sense. I answer far too many of the IK answers with hopefully that makes sense. And the Golden S asks, IK answers, what if Apple made three versions of the Mac Pro? Apple Silicon, Ryzen Threadripper, and Intel Xeon. Why Threadripper? Because why not? Now, I completely agree, why not? Well, there are definitely reasons. Number one, they would need to have, I believe, a different socket to doing the Intel Xeon version, which means that you're gonna have two x86 versions. The Threadrippers are very power hungry and get very hot, but they are massively multi-threaded uh, in terms of the, I think it's 64 thread that they do for the, the top of the line thread rippers, and they are insanely fast. However, we also did the maths for uh, Apple Silicon, and it looks like, I'll, I'll put the link to the video where we did some maths up here, uh, but it looks very much like the Apple Silicon Mac Pro will be faster than any thread ripper, and it's like not even close, at least with the thread rippers that were around when we were doing our calculations. Now, that could have changed. There could be new thread rippers by then. Yeah, the Apple Silicon versions are going to be pretty immense. Uh, so my my hope is that they will do a Xeon if they have to, purely because they have a contract already in place. Now, John Prosser has been reporting that there is definitely another Intel Mac Pro in the works. We mentioned a couple of shows ago, I think, that it would be great if they could use like an M1 instead of the T2 chip that they have on the board, because then... Uh, Basically, the M1 could kind of run the operating system with its super fast uh, single thread stuff. And the Xeon could sit there and just kind of churn through like super heavy duty tasks that it's more suited to. That would be really interesting. I don't know how practical it is, but it would be quite cool if they could. Uh, I don't know if they'd have to kind of virtualize their own operating system inside in order to do it. Or if there would be something like Rosetta that split the work. So if they they came across something that's Intel coded, it just throws it to the Intel chips and lets them just deal with it natively. But it's a good question. I would be definitely interested to see what you could do with a Threadripper one, but from memory, I think Linus Tech Tips may have made a Threadripper Mac Pro Hackintosh. Um, so that might be worth checking out. But anyway, guys, if you've enjoyed this video, a like would be brilliant, a subscribe would be even better, and thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to get involved, send us your questions, and I'll see you in the next one.